Welcome to the Mindset Game Podcast. I'm so excited to have a special guest with us today, and her name is Kathleen Gramsey. Kathleen has over 20 years of experience as a board-certified massage therapist, where in addition to her own practice, she was a spring training therapist for Major League Baseball. She developed the Kinesage Self-Care and Massage Through Movement Methods, training occupational, physical, and massage therapists around the world to release the root causes underlying soft tissue disorders like sciatica and carpal tunnel. She has also developed a virtual self-care system and brought that into many businesses, training leaders and individuals on how to reset their nervous systems so they can think clearly, function even more effectively, and engage positively in their environments. And so Kathleen, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, I'm delighted because I think this is uh, the topic we're discussing today is so relevant to many of the people listening. I would venture to say most of the people listening. So would you be willing to start us off with a little bit about how you got into this line of work? Yes. Do you know that statement, necessity is the mother of invention? <laughs> that is it in a nutshell. I um, I wanted to do something that I thought was more meaningful than the work I had been doing in business at the time. So I became a massage therapist and I wanted to be effective. I wanted to be therapeutic versus just the nice relaxation massage. And basically there was Swedish and there was deep tissue at the time, which I call beat them up deep tissue, right? Is how it was, it was taught at that time. And so I was like, yes, I want to, I want to help people with issues. So I went on that path and gung ho, just a year, um, I started my practice. I also worked uh, at the Ritz Carlton here in Phoenix and I worked on all the sports teams there. Um, so I got a lot of practice in very quickly because I was working seven days a week the first year. And what happened was that everybody loved my work, except my body did not love the work I was doing because I had accumulated chronic pain and tension in my body to the point where literally it, my body was telling me if I didn't find a smarter way to work, I was done. So I am a geek when it comes to anatomy and kinesiology. And so I had this thought that maybe if I could figure out how to use the nervous system to design for movement instead of force that I could continue. And so I became my own experiment. I started using movement in the nervous system and um, just basically figured out how everything works in the body relative to movement and how to reverse engineer it to release tension patterns that underlie muscular skeletal disorders like carpal tunnel and tendonitis and all those things. So I cleared my pain out, including a 20 year back problem, a chronic back problem that would just randomly show up and leave me on my back for five days at a time. It was severe. So cleared that out. Then um, I said, okay, now I want to make this into a method of massage that's easier and kinder for me and my clients. Did that. That was going great. A few years down the road, I'm at a conference. Here's other therapists. They still have the pain I no longer have. So I sit down and write everything down on the couch at a year, writing it all out, make a curriculum, become a nationally certified provider and teach it around the country. So not around the world, although there were people that did come, but it was mostly around the country. <laughs> um, and did that. And then when 2015 rolled around, the opioid addiction epidemic was now in my awareness and I, I like I couldn't get it out of my head. So that's when I knew I needed to take what I figured out and make it into a virtual system for the public. So what I did was I retired from my practice. I kept teaching, retired from my practice and developed this virtual this self-care system for the public. And I had this great idea that I was going to then do it for the public. So anybody who wanted an alternative to opioids and to drugs could have one. And, um, and then I also took it into business because 75% of work lost work days are due to muscular skeletal issues. And I see, yes, we got all this problem with chronic tension and muscular skeletal disorders and workers comp claims, but everybody is so stressed, they're not even able to see it. And so that's when I said, okay, let me back up here because chronic stress um, literally is like, you know, shutting the lens down. Uh, it's because it just gets so distracted in other things. So that's when I brought and developed the mindful resilience program 
to companies because I thought, you know, everything that companies are looking to solve really on the surface, they think it's these different things, but in essence, really the underlying, the underlying cause and foundation of all the challenges is really what side of the nervous system you're operating from. So, wow. Thank you for sharing that. And I think for many people listening, life has evolved kind of like that, right? Out of necessity, if you will. And what a blessing sometimes those necessities can be when we're open to learning that and taking action as you did. I'm curious, what is it that kind of made you decide to to bring your programs into business? Well, I really wanted to be able to affect change, greater change. And I thought, where but business is is the largest audience of people who could who really need it. So sitting at desks all day or being sedentary, whether that's in a position as a truck driver or it's at a a desk or it's working in a warehouse, it is these chronic tension patterns of how we move or don't move. And so that was the initial idea was where can I impact the greatest amount of people to be able to learn so they can learn that they have the ability to change their own relationships to their bodies and their health, mental, emotional, and physical health as a result. And when you speak of the nervous system, some people listening are not yet familiar with what specifically you mean or the connection between that and what we, you know, what's manifested as chronic chronic stress or tension in the body. So what can you share a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, that's it's so important because I think everybody knows everybody knows what stress is, everybody knows what it feels like. But it, we don't know what it actually looks like relative to from the nervous perspective. And what is so amazing about it is, is that really, if you want to think of it in very simple terms, we have two sides of our nervous system that are automatic or autonomic is the real term for it, or autonomic nervous system. There is emergency mode. And then there is the other side, which is the parasympathetic, which is the restorative side. This is where all the good things about us as human beings When we're in parasympathetic, that's when all the beautiful, creative, joyful aspects of us show up. When we're emergency mode, that's threat mode, right? This is where our nervous system is perceiving threat. It is where, whether it's perceived real threat, like in the old days of being chased by a tiger, or it is our own perceived threat mentally or emotionally or, or, you know, sense of safety. And so the, especially with the pandemic, right? Emergency mode is great. Like stress is actually very functional and the system is designed perfectly. It's not a flawed system. The challenge has been that it's not meant to be, we're not meant to live there. We're meant to be able to have the option of if there is a threat to be able to fight, right? We can fight and stick up for ourselves. We can run away, flight, or the most basic of their survival mechanisms is freeze, which is li- literally like feigning dead. It is literally, it's no mobility. It is simply no mobility. That's it. So if you think like a tortoise drawing its heads and legs in, it literally comes from that, that evolution of our brain, that reptilian limbic side of this nervous system. So it's, um, so really we're meant to do what we need to do, fight, flight, or, or freeze in the moment. And then we're meant to switch back to back to great sleep, back to being kind and loving, back to being creative, back to our immune systems functioning great, right? That's where we're meant to live. With especially the last two years in the pandemic, we have all been continuously triggered staying in emergency mode. And so what we can see is there is very specific patterns to um, what it looks like when we're in emergency mode. And what's great about this is, is that in parallel situations, so if you look in the, in the world I came from in terms of experience in body work, the body-mind connection, you learn about the languages that the body is speaking. It speaks through pain. It speaks through, you know, all kinds of things that you can sense and feel. And then in the world of psychology, right, they were also seeing that these readers were relationships between our thoughts, how we think, 
how we feel, our behaviors, because we want to think and feel better, right? <laughs> and then the body is holding all of this. So the body is going to then be on the receiving end of whatever those choices are. So there are very specific patterns. If it's fight, it is anger and frustration. It um, And then it shows up. Um, so it could show up as skepticism. It could show up as, you know, uh, you know, just something like, no, not open to things, being very close minded, rash decisions. Um, and then so and then it shows up as we've seen in behavior. If you look about what we've seen in the world in the last two years, all the violence, right, all of that acting out of all that anger and frustration, it makes perfect sense when you think about it from the nervous system. And then what happens is, is then it shows up in the body in very physical conditions. It can show up as cardiovascular disease. It can show up as hypertension. It can show up as gut issues. It could show up as all these different things physically. And so when you understand that that's what fight looks like. Flight looks like something else. That's the, where the anxiety comes in. That's running away, avoidance behaviors. Um, and then that can show up as actually um, low blood pressure and chronic fatigue, for example. And then overwhelm or freeze shows up as completely different because that's a lack of. So that is where people are likely to be more hopeless, depressed. Um, have a sense of it's never going to get over. It's never going to be done. We're going to be like this forever, right? It's it's this it's this hopelessness state that leads to depression, and then or can lead to depression. Not always, but can. And then it shows up in different behaviors. So when we look at the behaviors, we see things like everybody's trying to feel better, right? So what how we've been taught to feel better is. Go, um, let's see, if I need more energy, get caffeine, right? Let me go have a monster drink. Let me go have an energy drink. Let me, quote unquote, energy drink. Um, <laughs> let me go have cocktails. Like, so you, you know, like give me sugar at the day to keep me going. And now give me a cocktail at night to wind down and the remote and don't talk to me, right? Those are our behaviors. All we're trying to do is we're trying to feel better, but we've not been taught that we actually can switch ourselves and we don't have to put something else in our body to try to change how we feel because we can actually do that if we understand how to work with it. And then of course, then the body is not living with those repercussions of those choices. Because if you really need to, you know, some people have already figured out that if I'm really stressed, I can go run, I could go work out, I can go for a walk, I could be in nature, I could sit down and just, you know, be with my dog who just, you know, unconditionally loves me or, you know, be hold my child and be happy or my grandchild. It's very simple things that we can do that can make a big difference on being able to switch our nervous systems. So I think some of the people listening now might be really curious about how what you're sharing now around kind of that fight flight freeze is manifesting in the body like what do you see or what have you seen in your line of work um, perhaps of people at work um, around how it manifests so it's kind of and this is what really got me thinking about bringing in mindful resilience to companies because what i saw was so we're having, we're having, we have a lot, we're having a lot of accidents, right? All this, we got a lot of accidents. We got big high claims. Well, accidents are not just because of physical issues of tripping or falling. It's being distracted, right? Mentally, emotionally distracted. Um, absenteeism. People are either, you know, they're like, they're just not showing up to work or they, there's present, the word presenteeism, which means that they're here in body, but they're definitely not here in mind or engagement. Um, employee turnover. So right now, there's been a number of studies that say it's called like the big resignation that's going on. 60%, the, the surveys are showing that 60% of current employees right now are ready to walk. Now, why would that be so high right now? Well, if you think about the fact that if everybody's living in this threat mode and seeing things through a negative lens, then it makes sense that people are saying, I'm done. I'm fed up with this. I got to go. And then 
leaders might be thinking everything's fine, right? Like, oh, they're fine. No, they're not fine. They're, they're definitely not fine. So um, the other thing is just, of course, that diminished productivity or lack of engagement where people, um, they're, they're maxed out in terms of with all of the changes through COVID, right? With, with smaller teams, with working from home, people are being asked to do two or three times as much as they did before. They're doing it in isolation. And then when they get there, oh, here's your evaluation. And it says, these are the things you have to do to meet expectation. But it literally says um, what you, that you go above and beyond your job description and that's meeting expectations, right? There's this disconnect between what people are expecting of their people, not recognizing that people neurologically are right now fried, frankly. And so it doesn't mean it's going to stay this way, but giving people actual tools to then shift neurologically, right? Get us, give us tools so that we can nourish ourselves so we can come back and, and know how to toggle back and forth, back into that parasympathetic where all that creativity we need right now, that's where we find it. All of those solutions to all these challenges of this repeated change and figuring all this stuff out, it's in parasympathetic. We have to be able to know how to switch ourselves back. So that's where I'm. That's where I'm seeing it in and how that looks. Um, and then on the physical side, it shows up as migraines. It shows up as neck pain. It shows up as shoulder and back pain, distracted thinking. Right, just not even being able to. Uh, just like you know, people ask you a question, and they're like, "What? You're talking to me?" You know, you're saying these things and it's fascinating to me because I heard these things being said in different trainings that I've had with people or leaders sharing about what team members have articulated or what they're seeing is happening. And so what what might be some of those tools to shift neurologically, to, to shift that response? What can we do as employees or as leaders of teams for ourselves and others? Well, the first thing is to recognize, right? I would say for leaders, for leaders to recognize the incredible sandwich your leadership teams and your managers are in. I call it the stress sandwich because people that are in managed, especially middle management or senior management, middle management, they are tasked with achieving the goals of the company, of the shareholders. They're, it's all on their shoulders and they have to do it through all the people they're supervising who are all neurologically, everybody's in emergency mode. So it puts a disservice on the managers because you're asking managers and leaders to develop people. If they're not neurologically able to even have a grip on themselves today, how can you expect them to sit down with a calm mind, being present, and ask and and you know and say how should how should we be developing your career path here, right? It's it's not fair to ask that of people when they don't have the tools or the awarenesses of it. So that's the first thing, is recognize that. And particularly, I would invite leaders, C-suite leaders, to really acknowledge that your entire business, really the culture of your business, if you want to know what it is, it's you and it's your managers in the middle and whatever, whoever they're being is your culture, whoever you're being is your culture. And if you would, you know, I invite you to really let that sink in. And because it might be a little painful right now if you're if you're operating out of emergency mode and you have not been at your best or they are not at their best. It is also the starting place because the first thing in answer to your question is awareness. We have to understand what the real problem is in order to be able to solve it. So we have to be able to open our eyes and say this irritation, this shortness that I like me biting people's heads off and expecting them to spend 24 seven to help us get out of this hole is not a reasonable expectation. And nor are you going to be uh, endearing people to you when you're, when you're chewing them up and spitting them out. So having the awareness of what's currently going on 
understanding that if you have communication problems, communication problems are neurologically, if you're in emergency mode, you're hearing things as threat. You're not able to be open to ideas. You're not able to be a creative. You're not able to, you don't have the bandwidth. So to be able to look at that and say, okay, the awareness is this is where we are first and foremost. And, and to acknowledge those things and look at the obvious things that can change, right? So it, as the old adage goes, the, somebody goes to the doctor and this says, doc, it hurts when I do this. And you say, then the doc says, stop doing that, right? That's the simplest thing. Stop expecting people to work 24 seven. Stop expecting people, you know, throwing a ton of things, new change, new things at people and expecting them to just be fine. Right, we can stop those things, start asking more, start listening more to be able to get a sense of what really is going on so you can really see where you're starting. Ask what they need, right? That's all in the awareness of very simple things. Um, how it looks in terms of neurologically, we could say that it is um, so like as individuals. So this is leaders to everybody, leaders to top and, you know, the brand new employee walking in the door is pay attention to where you're spending your time. If you are stressed and now you just spend, you know, your next two hours at night watching drama TV where it's like getting you really, it's intense, you know, like a lot of the series are really intense. Um, is it like you're just constantly pushing yourself on your weekends, like where are you allowing yourself time to just be, to enjoy nature, to just to meditate, to read a to read a novel like that's funny, or just laugh with your kids, or the various simplest things that you can do to be able to just stop, literally stop the the assault is the very first thing. The second thing would be then to be able to then start to choose other solutions, right? Or other make other choices in lieu of those. So it can be as simple as uh, maybe I'm going to um, choose to take five minutes between leaving, even if you're leaving your office is literally one room to the next one, right? It shuts your door and then mentally just do some breathing, um, you have some kind of ritual that says my day is now complete and now I can go be with my family. Very simple, something very simple like that. Um, or deciding that you're not going to hit that silly little button on any movie you're watching that says next episode continues. Like decide, turn that thing off before that thing starts <laughs> so that you actually get to bed at a reasonable hour drinking water, you know, like making one green tea instead of five coffees, just do one coffee, one water. Like it's simple, simple things that can start because all of that influences our nervous system, right? All of these help condition us back to how do we get more, more into that restorative side. And I love the simplicity of what you're sharing um, and what about in the moment where you're at choice? Do I click on next episode or not? For example, what do you say to those individuals that are like, but I need that things are really hard. Yes. Well, and to acknowledge it, it is true that things are hard. What, what those look at what you're doing and, and understand what's, what is it giving you? Right. Like to your point, right. So sitting there and watching six episodes or whatever it is helps me be in a vegetative state, basically, right? It helps, I get to check out for a few minutes, which when the mind is that fatigued, that feels like the, the best thing you could do. This is where we have to adult ourselves, truly, because the nervous system really, it is biased to um, the least amount of effort, right? We actually have to use will because it's always gonna go for, when it comes to this body mind, man, it goes for the least effort. And, and of course, this is chatting us up the whole time saying, oh, blah, 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 right? This is what we have to watch out for as for the audio version of this, I'm pointing to my head, right? We have to really listen to who, that voice that's talking. We have a mind, we're not our minds. 
We have a mind. I have a heart that feels I'm not my heart. I have a body that moves and feels I'm not it either. I'm the one in here who can observe those things. So basically, we are awareness, right? That's what consciousness is. That's who we really are. We've just been so conditioned by the mind running us, right? It being in the driver's seat that we have we have um, abdicated our kingdom and our dominion over our our habits, our mental habits, our emotional habits, and our physical habits. So it is one of those things, I just, little hacks. I mean, and I do, I can't tell you, I got plenty of hacks, trust me. But one of them is, is that I will say on a weeknight, if especially if there's something I want to watch that's going on, um, I will say, okay, my time is nine o'clock, like nothing, like it's nine o'clock. If I have to, I will put, I will put the alarm on, on my phone. Because when that thing goes off, I stand up physically make myself stand up and turn it off with the remote down. It seems ridiculous, but I need to be in charge. I, the adult, so I, it's like me, I talk to my five-year-old mind and I say, okay, there's a new regime here. It's not you. And you could get, and then it could be back talking just like a 13 year old, like beep, 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 back at you. you fine. You're, uh, we're, this is what we're doing. Talk all you want. And then you put yourself into bed and now you get an extra couple hours of sleep or now you start winding down and you put yourself in an environment, not on screen for an hour before you go to sleep that actually helps you get restorative sleep and you feel great. And you're like, okay, that was worth turning off that stupid button, right? But it's, we have to use initiative. We have to use will just like we do for other things. But the payoff when we use it for ourselves is is the greatest freedom there is because then we are directing our minds and our bodies and our lives as a result so i'm curious this kind of concept of interruption yes interrupting the old pattern right so for example yeah. the alarm that's an auditory kind of interruption we use the body we stand up right so there's a physical change that happens and then we click the button what other hacks do you have specifically relating to the body, to the body or to movement to interrupt those patterns? So many people who work out, right? So there, if you, if you have ever been in a place in your life where you're like, okay, I want to get more serious about my workout routine. It is cueing, right? It is setting your cues, your environmental cues so that your body follows. So for example, I do Pilates uh, at 5.30, two mornings a week, and I make sure that my workout stuff is there. It's already out because if it's already out, all I got to do is get out of bed and they're right there. I grab them and then I go. So that's the first thing is, is understanding that the body needs prep. So anything that you can do that's, I mean, we've done this forever. Like, you know, your mom used to make your lunch the night before, or just like simple little things that make it easier. Take the resistance out by those little simple things that you can do. Um, you know, whether that is meditating in the morning so that you have um, yourself quieted, you're really actually tuning into your whole self before you let the mind just take you down the road for the day. <laughs> which, which we know can, you know, that can be quite the, quite the ride some days. So, and all you gotta do is get in your car and then it starts, right. Or maybe it doesn't even wait that long. You walk out of the bathroom and you're talking to somebody and it's off. Right. So do things that really set you up for grounding in yourself, for being able to recognize that you're in here, you're in control in the sense of yourself, which is all we need to be because we're not in control of what happens outside of ourselves. And just understanding that I don't have to control what's out there. The more I can master myself, the more I'm able to handle what goes on out there. The more I'm able to respond to what happens in the world. And the more I'm able to, that's how we build resilience. Resilience happens not by not being tested, right? It's just like a muscle. Muscles don't get stronger when they're not tested. They get stronger because they're tested, so when we can do this, where we can, we can set ourselves up to then be able to meet the test, whatever that is, even if that's just the decision of I'm going to go for a walk 
and even, you know, instead of eating, eating the chocolate or whatever, whatever, I'm going to go for a walk and do that. Then the next time it's easier, right? Because inertia works. However, whatever, whatever we do, we are imprinting deeper. So inertia takes a minute to switch the, the direction. But once you do, then that's a great thing because you can only start, you only have to start one one place. So the thoughts, the emotions, and the behaviors and the body, I said, all work together, right? So they go off the rail in one direction. But the best thing is, all you got to do is start one place. Maybe that's doing affirmations. Today is going to, I'm going to trust that good things can happen today. And then that starts you saying, well, maybe, maybe I feel like that could be true. And then maybe you're kinder to people, which then opens up somebody to say, you know, would you like an opportunity to do such and such? I mean, you don't, you don't know, but all you got to do is pick one spot and start there. Maybe it's, you know, not having six cups of coffee. Maybe it's just, I'm going to have one cup of coffee and then I'm going to switch to a couple glasses of water before I have another one. It doesn't need to be a big deal. You don't have to beat yourself up. It's not about trying to do it all in one day. It's just incremental progress today. Like what's one thing I can do today in the area that is the most challenging for me? Does that make sense? It, it does. And it's it just, I think, lessens some of the load or overwhelm that some people might be feeling around changing the trajectory of some of their habits, um, you know, because it really is, could be as simple as setting ourselves up in advance to make a better choice when we are in that depleted moment. And what might be one simple technique that perhaps you can even guide us through that will help us to kind of reconnect with our body and kind of create that interruption, which will make it easier for us to make better decisions and, you know, create more momentum towards what we want. What What's one technique that you can offer? This is something that is powerful and simple because anytime we take our attention out of the mind chatter and into our body, We are giving ourselves that opportunity to pause and to create the ability to make a different choice or the ability to look at a situation and respond rather than react. So I'm going to share one that is a grounding technique that you can do anywhere that you can do with your eyes open or closed. You can do it in a meeting. You can do it um, talking to your 17-year-old or your five-year-old grandchild or whoever. But what it does is it helps you to have awareness that you, you're you in here, you're in your body. And um, I can tell you that when you do it, it changes you neurologically It changes not only your perceptions of what you're looking or listening to, but neurologically, it actually changes who you're being. So it affects in a positive way, other people. Okay, so it's very simple. So I'm going to invite those who can, if you're in a space that you can close your eyes, because it just gives you a a ability to to go in a little bit more. So I'm just going to invite you And what I'm going to ask you to do through this process is, as I take you through the body, is to just breathe very nice and comfortably. And then with each place that we go, just to take a breath in and then let it out and be more aware of where you're at, in which you'll understand in a second. Okay, so do do some nice breaths. And the first thing I'd like you to do is take your attention out of your thinking and take it down into your neck. Take a breath and let it out and just release any tension that you feel in your neck and shoulders. And I'd like you to have your feet on the ground. And if you, if you can, if you haven't already, then just lean up against the back of a chair or you can just do this. um, If you're doing it standing, we'll just take your energy straight down. So we just take in our attention into our neck and shoulders. And now take your attention into your chest. Just notice if you feel any tightness there. If you feel any constriction, tightness, heaviness. And with your breath, just let it out on the exhale. And if you are sitting in a chair, 
then I'd like you to just be aware of the back of the chair against your shoulders. As you breathe in and out, feeling that support of the chair against your back. And with the next breath, take your attention into your abdomen. And with your exhale, let out any tension. Just let your belly go. Don't worry about holding it, just let it go. And have the awareness of just letting the chair support you as you take your attention now into your hips. Feeling the chair beneath you, really supporting you and holding your body weight easily, comfortably. Taking your attention down into your backs of your thighs, down into your calves, and taking your attention down into your feet and really sensing the floor beneath you. Now keep your sense of awareness of the floor beneath you and then open your eyes. And keep that sense of the chair supporting you. So right now your body is 100% supported. And tell me what you noticed since you just experienced this, if you would, Varid. Oh my goodness. I absolutely do feel supported. Um, it was really cool as you kind of took me down the different parts of my body and kind of that release, you know, to actually feel the ease. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you still sense that awareness of the chair beneath you and the, your feet on the floor? Now that you've mentioned it, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you keep just that much attention, just a tiny little bit of awareness, when, as we're talking, we're talking right now, I have an awareness of my feet on the floor. What that does is it changes my, how I'm relating to you because I'm grounded neurologically. My body knows it's grounded and your body, your nervous system is looking at me for cues. So as I'm able to do this, you neurologically, your nervous system is picking up sensations of greater safety. And that's honestly, everything comes down to a sense of safety. And that really is at the heart of our nervous system, keeping, keeping us in emergency mode. It puts us there when we don't feel safe, when we feel threatened. So it is something you can do for yourselves. You can do in meetings. You can teach your children when they're having, you know, or grandchildren, when they're having, they're upset, when they're going through emotional things. Just take them through this and then ask them to share, okay, honey, what's bothering you, right? Or team, what's the problem? What, 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 where are we really at with this? It opens up the ability to have deeper levels of conversation. And that's just one very simple technique that you can do. But it, this is why I'm fascinated and why I've been studying it all these years, because the skill sets that the body has the mind doesn't even know about. And once we start to really see our bodies as a partner, as an, an intelligent, literally a dynamic intelligence that we can tap into, we can tap more into our intuitions, we can tap more into our creativity. There is so much here that we have not been taught. We, the body has been the stepchild, right? It's only, it's been a slave to serve the mind. And really when you start to have greater appreciation and respect for the gifts and those messages that it's telling us, then, and we start to listen more, the more we see that the power we have is far greater than what we contend with. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Well, it certainly is. And I thank you for the reminder that once we, you know, kind of pause to acknowledge what might be, uh, you know, kind of the underlying cause, if you will, of some of the stress and tension that we're experiencing and 
we find some way to interrupt that pattern. So I'm so grateful to you for taking a topic that can seem very overwhelming and sometimes almost impossible to handle when it's so big, but just reminding us of the simple things, the body, the, the, the power of preparation, the power of uh, really tuning in to what might be uh, creating the issues that are manifesting certain thoughts and emotions and behaviors. Um, and, uh, and I am curious if somebody wants to dive even deeper into the work of the body, into uh, you know some of the uh, the things that you teach in organizations and to the public, how can they access that? They can find me at my website, which is my name, KathleenGramsey.com. That makes it pretty easy. And I'm happy to have different conversations. What shows there is is mostly the um, is all the business, right? Is all the programs for the organizations. There is much more. So if people want to reach out to me directly, my um, email is kg at kathleengramsey.com. So that's K-A-T-H-L-E-E-N-G-R-A-M-Z-A-Y.com. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for all the wonderful insights that you brought to our attention today. Many really helpful reminders. My pleasure. And I, I just did think too, that if people want to reach out to me, I am on LinkedIn. And on Wednesdays, um, I do a little, just a five minute little podcast with a woman named Lindsay Mullenberg. And it is along the mindful resilience lines, but just very simple, uh, a particular topic, and then an action, a call to action or a challenge for the week. So it can give you ways to practice these things. Um, and then you can also reach out to me there if you're interested in having more conversation about how we could um, how we could bring these tools to your teams so that you all can function better and enjoy being the amazing people and organizations you are. Oh, thank you, Kathleen. My pleasure. Thank you. It's been delightful. <laughs>